question. Her recent work documents the impacts of natural and human disturbances on forest canopy community, communities at different spatial scales from single branches to landscapes. Nalini is a passionate communicator about science to people in all walks of life and has innovated science and conservation programs for non-traditional public audiences, such as faith-based groups, youth, urban youth, artists, and legislators. Since 2003, she has brought science education, conservation projects, and nature imagery to the incarcerated adults and youth around the country. Beyond her scholarly work, Nalini recognized the importance of Barbie in the lives of young children and the influence the doll has over shaping children's perceptions of po career possibilities. This inspired her to create Treetop Barbie. She and her students bought secondhand Barbies and outfitted them with canopy climbing gear and an educational book to offer forest e ecology as a model, model for a possible career. In 2019, National Geographic and Mattel sought out Nalini to serve as a consultant on a new partnership they were developing a line of Barbies that focused on making science interesting and accessible to the children who played with them. With input from National Geographic, Mattel created dolls, outfits, and accessories to highlight women who are astrophysicists, nature science photographers, entomologists, and wildlife biologists. After lunch today, please feel free to visit our display of the National Geographic Barbies our own forestry thing Barbies and visit with Nalini. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you Nalini Nicardi. Well, I am thrilled with this theme of women in forestry. And when I look at the people here at this conference, I see that this is not just a collection of individual people, it's a real tapestry of women and men who are interacting because of their collective focus on understanding trees and taking care of them. In a similar way, when I perch in the canopy of a forest like this in Costa Rica, I'm struck that a forest is not just a collection of individual trees, but rather it constitutes something of a tapestry, something that is complex, that is connected, that is strong, that is useful, and that is beautiful. Today, I'd like to share my thoughts about this, sort of this idea of, of creating a tapestry of care for forests um, that we need to weave. And I think we need this interweaving more than ever because all of us are walking what I think of as a sort of a knife ridge of despair and hope about the environment and about our planet. If we lean too far on the side of despair, we become immobilized because we think, oh, it's not worth it to do anything. But if we lean too much on the side of hope, we think, oh, well, that's going to be taken care of, so I don't need to do anything. Um, and so I think that this, this opportunity to speak to all of you today has given me the opportunity to reflect on how I might walk that knife ridge of despair and hope. First, I thought I would talk about sort of my own story in terms of how I have developed a way to walk that knife ridge. Um, and the organizers of this conference asked me to reflect on and to share with you kind of the, the, the pathways and the means in which I have taken this on. So first, what I'd like to talk about is how I've drawn on, on my foundations, our innate interests and our capacity, the values of our birth families, and the early influences and mentors that affected my choices in my life and my career. Secondly, I developed a core discipline, in my case, uh, coming to become familiar with theory and practices and knowledge of a particular discipline or subdiscipline, which for me was forest ecology. And finally, I decided to branch out to extend what I know to connect and engage with other sectors of society about the importance of trees and forests in our lives. So first I'll start out with our, my, my own foundations. My foundations were my parents. Both my parents were immigrants. My dad came from India. He was a scientist with the National Institutes of Health. Uh, he was raised as a Hindu. My mom, you can see here, um, was actually from the Ukraine. Um, she uh, was an Orthodox, raised as an Orthodox Jew and she studied languages and communication. 
So my own deep roots, my own foundation, uh, were really kind of a mixture, kind of a tapestry. And my siblings and I really learned how to think and act across disciplines, across cultures, and across religions. And as a kid, I had, as my innate foundation, two things that I loved the most. One was climbing trees. I, my parents had these eight maple trees uh, that lined the driveway that I would climb every day after school. And the other was modern dance. I just loved the, uh, the creativity and the use, the use of my body to express myself. Well, there were also um, sort of a, a precept that my parents raised all of us kids with was a sense of contribution. As many immigrants do, they want their children to contribute to the new country that they've come to. And so that has been very much instilled in me as a young person and has continued through my adulthood. The organizers here of this conference also asked me to talk about mentors or people who influenced me as a young child. One of them, as probably many of us here, was Jane Goodall, and I just wanted to be Jane Goodall when I was a little kid. But the other was my dance teacher, Erica Timai, who was a, a German dancer, um, and she believed that every child, every person is a dancer, whether fat or thin, tall or short. We all have a creative spirit that should be fostered, that should be manifested, that should be used to help the world. So those were my influences, the deep, found, the deep roots of my foundations. And I'd like to talk now a little bit about how I developed a core discipline, a place within academia that I feel comfortable about, that I feel is my tribe, that is almost my family. And that was the world of forest ecology. And I was lucky enough to have mentors, two of which were very wonderful, strong women. One was Caroline Bledsoe at the University of Washington. The other was Linda Brubaker, a dendrochronologist. But there were also a couple of mentors right here at the Oregon State University, George Carroll, who studied fungi and endophytes in the forest canopy, and Bill Dennison, who was one of the true pioneers of forest ecology research. So I became familiar with the field of forest ecology. I found mentors, I found colleagues, I found fellow students who shared my love and my passion for forest ecology. But of course, everybody, even within a field of, of a, a single discipline, an academic discipline, has to find a specialty within that in which to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I chose to study the forest canopy. Now, this was in the early 1980s. There were really very, very few people who climbed into the canopy. Um, in fact, the canopy was called the last biotic frontier. And so, of course, as a young scientist, that's like the most attractive thing that you can think of is to think about discovering new things in a new frontier. And so I learned how to climb uh, using mountain climbing techniques from a guy named Don Perry. Since then, in the last 35, 40 years, canopy researchers have, have been able to develop new ways, uh, innovative ways, so, uh, a non-destructive and safe ways to climb into the forest canopy. And that includes construction cranes, uh, canopy walkways, hot air balloons, and now we're relying more and more on remote sensing, things like drones and satellite imagery, in order to understand, to document, to analyze um, the forest canopy. Well, if you climbed into the forest canopy with me in my field site in Costa Rica, I think you would immediately understand that the microclimate of the forest canopy is very different from what you experience on the dark, damp forest floor. There's much more insulation. There are greater extremes of relative humidity and temperature. There's a lot more wind. It's really like sort of the atmosphere of an open field. And for that reason, there are a tremendous number of animals and plants that have adapted over evolutionary time to live part or all of their life cycles up in the forest canopy. And what fascinated me most were not the animals up there, but the plants that live up there, the so-called epiphytes, um, the plants that do not gain nutrients from or water from their host trees or the forest floor, but rather gain them from atmospheric sources. Um, they, uh, they also form what we call canopy soils, that is, that's composed soil in the forest canopy on branches and trunks that are composed of the dead and decomposing living epiphytes, the mosses, the bromeliads, the ferns, and so forth, that die and decompose in place and create this canopy soil that differs somewhat from its counterparts on the forest floor, it tends to have lower pH, uh, greater extremes of relative humidity and of soil moisture, um, and a smaller density and diversity of invertebrates. Well, as an ecosystem ecologist, I was most interested in the functions of these canopy components. That is, what are they doing in the forest as a whole? 
Um, in the Monteverde Cloud Forest, the canopy components are rather small compared to the forest as a whole, but they actually have what we have found is that they have a disproportionately uh, more important uh, set of uh, ecological roles than what their biomass might indicate. One of the things that I became very interested in was how these epiphytes obtain and hold on to nutrients. And we know that there are small, very dilute amounts of nutrients contained within each drop of water, each droplet of mist and fog that arrives at the forest canopy. And that these epiphytes have evolved over evolutionary time to be extremely efficient at intercepting and holding on to these atmospherically born nutrients. Ken Clark, who was then a graduate student of mine, compared the concentration of, of nitrogen that he collected at the top of the canopy versus through fall at the bottom of the canopy. And he found that over 60% of the nitrate and ammonium that came in from outside the ecosystem in the form of mist and fog were intercepted and retained by these canopy components, these epiphytes. Um, we also know that they're transferred down to the forest floor. They don't just stay up there forever. And they might be transferred by simply sliding, these epiphytes sliding off the branch, what we call epi-slides, or when branches fall down to the forest floor, or even when whole trees fall over and these epiphytes and their associated soils come down to the forest floor to decompose and then become available to terrestrially rooted vegetation. Well, in addition to nutrient cycling and the fact that these epiphytes are enhancing the nutrient cycles of the forest as a whole, we've also documented that these epiphytes can actually function as a keystone resource. That is, despite their small biomass, they provide resources in the way of sugars and nectar, in terms of fruits, in terms of nesting materials for a wide range of birds and arboreal mammals. So our conclusion was that although epiphytes are a small part of the ecosystem as a whole in terms of biomass, they have these disproportionately large and important ecological roles within the forest. Well, the field of canopy studies has grown tremendously in the last 40 years, um, but nearly all of the research, the research that's gone on on the forest canopy has occurred in primary forests and forests that have not been affected by human activities such as deforestation or global climate change or invasive species. And one of the things that I've become aware of and researchers in actually have become aware of is that global climate change, for example, is a disturbance that is negatively affecting these epiphytic plants. Uh, we carried out some experiments in 2002 where we actually took mats of epiphytes from the upper cloud forest where there's lots of mist and fog and then transplanted them to trees lower down the mountain where there's naturally less mist and fog. And what we found was that those epiphyte mats that were exposed to these drier conditions, conditions that are predicted by global climate change models, resulted in lower leaf production and higher plant mortality. So global climate change means really bad things in terms of um, epiphytic survival and robustness. Well, some colleagues and I, three researchers and I are doing a study of right now, we just recently got an NSF grant um, to study the effects of climate change on these canopy plant communities. And I'm really happy to let you know that we have an, arbor, an arborist group that includes two really strong women that you can see here. And I just came back last week from a field, uh, our field site in Costa Rica where we've been climbing trees and, and sort of uh, 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 inserting uh, sensors and data loggers in order to monitor the effects of climate change on the trees as well as the epiphytes. Well, another disturbance that is going on in terms of tropical forests, of course, is deforestation, forest fragmentation that results in a scattering of forest patches and can be reduced to a single tree, a single relic tree within a forest. And we are trying to understand, in addition to the effects of climate change on these, on these epiphyte communities, what is the effect of isolation on these forest trees and their epiphytes? And I believe that this is really going on at the same time that humans are becoming more isolated from nature. And this is really something that to me expresses something to be alarmed about, the fact that we are not as connected to forests and trees and nature in general as we used to be, which puts us further on this knife ridge between hope and despair. 
And as I have become during my career, as time has gone on and become more and more aware of these human disturbances, these negative effects of human activities on forest canopies and forest ecosystems as a whole, I really had to ask my own self, what should I be doing about this? Is it enough for me to write my little papers for conferences to other scientists and scientific publications where a very small number of people who are already aware of the problems of deforestation and of climate change, what else might I need to do in addition to contributing to the scientific record? Well, this is where the sort of third piece of my career development has happened, and that is this, this idea of branching out, of moving the information that I've been fortunate enough to collect and be aware of, and to share that with other people who might have something to contribute to conservation, might have some additional ideas, uh, and might be able to take additional actions in terms of contributing to that tapestry of care for trees and forests. And so what I'd like to do now is to talk to you a little bit about this tapestry I've been mentioning, this idea that not only is the ecosystem an interwoven tapestry of species and interactions, but that humans can be part of this tapestry and that we need to include humans of many kinds, not just academics, not just arborists, not just forest conservationists, but all kinds of people. And so the way that I've gone about doing this is to think about the ways that we value trees, because people will take care of what they value. And I've done a lot of work to document the ecological values of trees and forest canopies. But my question is, how might I interweave the values of other societal sectors, the values of other people who might not automatically think of trees as their buddies, trees as their companions, trees as something to, to conserve and to protect. So what I'd like to do now is to talk to you about some of the ways, some of the strategies and tactics that I've used over the last 20 years with my colleagues and my students to interweave the values of other societal sectors into this tapestry of care for trees and forests. So when we think about little girls, for example, um, I know that when I was a little girl, what got me started on trees and forests was that I was able to climb trees. But, but what about a little girl who lives in New York City or Tokyo or Nairobi, a place where she may not have access to a tree to climb every afternoon after school as I did? And that's when I began thinking about what do little girls value? And of course, the answer pretty, pretty easily was, as my six-year-old daughter, when she was six years old, would say, Mom, it's Barbie, of course. I want a Barbie doll to my so much to my horror that she would actually ask for a Barbie. But what we did was we said, yes, if Barbie is a, that attractive, if there's sort of a natural, if there's a proclivity, if there's a sense that Barbie has value and what Barbie values has values for these little girls, well, why not adapt Barbie to, to that purpose? And so we began thinking about making treetop Barbie in my lab and I called up Mattel and this was back in 2004 and they said, uh, actually, no, we're not interested in that for some reason, couldn't imagine why. Um, and we said, well, then let's do it anyway. So we went to Goodwill stores, we bought used Barbies, we took her clothes off, we engaged uh, volunteer seamstresses to make little climbing outfits, we bought little helmets on eBay and then the key thing was that we made this little booklet about forest canopy plants of the Pacific Northwest with images of birds and lichens and mosses, just exactly the kind of booklet that Barbie needs if she wants to understand the canopy plants of the Pacific Northwest. Well, we sold her on my academic website, like completely useless really in terms of disseminating something broadly because who goes to an academics website except other academics. But astonishingly, as Jessica mentioned, I got a call in 2019, it was from National Geographic, they had partnered with Mattel and Mattel was then ready to make this set of Explorer Barbies that basically depicted uh, Barbie in, in all kinds of wonderful, exotic and adventurous and and, and exploratory functions, uh, a, a polar explorer, an astrophysicist, a wildlife photographer, and so forth. And they are now selling them in, you know, via Amazon and, and in Walmart stores and so forth. I was an advisor on the project. And so as a thank you, they gave me this, they made this one of a kind Nalini lookalike treetop Barbie, which I'm very proud of. And it sits in my office uh, to inspire young girls. But what was really important about this, I think, were two things. Number one, what it showed me was that between 2004 and 2019, a change had taken place, not Mattel, not National Geographic, but society. 
That is, there are now lots and lots of little girls who do not want the Barbie who goes to the prom and wants to marry Ken, but rather who wants to have some kind of a career or at least appreciate a career, even if she doesn't go into science herself as a career, that there's an appreciation for women doing exploratory and discovery type um, um, activities, which I think is really significant. Um, and so what I, the second thing I learned was that if I, I think about my matrix with the vertical threads being ecological values and the horizontal threads being other values, I found that it was actually quite simple to interweave the recreational value of this plastic toy doll into the tapestry of care and understanding and awareness of the importance of trees. And so that then led me to think about other kinds of societal sectors, other groups of people, other sets of values that I might be able to weave into this tapestry of care, intersecting those ecological values of, of canopy plants and forests. And so what I'd like to do is just walk you through some of the activities that my students and colleagues and I have done to interweave spiritual values, aesthetic values, and social justice values into this tapestry of, of understanding and awareness of trees and forests. So let's start with spiritual values. Well, although I was raised as a Hindu Jew, kind of weird combination of religions, even I am aware of the fact that many religions have spiritual connections to trees. And of course, when you reopen the Bible, the Old Testament, on the very first page, you learn about two very important trees, right? The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so I decided to take a tactic where instead of trying to overcome the barriers, the potential conflicts that we have very often when scientists and religious people confront each other about evolution versus creationism, I decided that instead of using the authorities of science, it made more sense in this case to think about the religious values, the spiritual values of trees, and to draw upon the authorities of world religions themselves. So what I did was I downloaded the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, the Talmud, uh, Buddhist stories, the Book of Mormon from the web, and I did a search for the words tree and forest. And I got data. Uh, these are the data I got from the Old Testament. There were 328 references to the words tree and forest in the Old Testament. And of course, I had to categorize them into symbolic and aesthetic use, analogies to life and God, practical use like food and shelter, location descriptions were very prominent, tree loss is bad, and there were even a few references to tree biology. And I also did, um, I also looked into some of the celebrations and the rituals and the holidays that had to do with, religious holidays that have to do with trees and forests. And I found that there were many of them. For example, Jews separate, uh, celebrate a wonderful holiday called Tub Shabbat, which is the new year for the trees. And they have a special Seder or a ceremonial dinner that it consists of fruits and nuts that celebrate the gifts that trees provide for Jews. And very often Jews provide money to do tree planting in Israel and in their own communities. We know, for example, in Buddhism, that Buddha found enlightenment underneath the bow tree. And so there's a real connection between Buddhism and, and what is sacred and what is important to Buddhists. And many followers of, of the Muslim religion look for the word Allah, which is written in Arabic. And actually they look at branches of trees. And if you, if you Google tree branches and Islam, you'll find hundreds of photographs of branches that actually seem to spell out the word Allah so that there is an appearance, a manifestation of that which is holy, that which is sacred, manifested in the tree architecture and structure itself. Well, taking these different kinds of data, that is taking the data that I got from reading the Holy Scriptures and studying up on the rituals and celebrations, I was able to put together a sermon called Trees and Spirituality, which I offer from the pulpits and bimas of places of worship. And I started out, as you might expect, uh, the Unitarians were the first people that opened their doors to me. Uh, but after that, I got sort of switched around and I got recommended to talk to Presbyterians and Catholics and Jews and Buddhists and so forth. And so now I've, I've given this sermon to over 40 places of worship. And I want to say that there has never, in all of those sermons, in all of those interactions with faith-based groups, there's never been a conflict about evolution versus creationism. 
And I think it's because I drew upon the scriptures themselves. And I think this is a case of what I think scientists need to do more of, which is a sense of intellectual humility. That's a philosophical term that I just, I just learned about, that instead of saying science is the only answer, we might say, you know, I can set that aside for the moment and I can think about other answers, other ways of knowing, other ways of understanding, which I don't have to necessarily believe in myself, but I can respect it enough to say, I'm taking information from this and sharing it back with you. We've done some other things with faith-based groups. One of the things my students and I have done is to map trees in courtyards of churches identify them to the species level, and then create little booklets, that black and white booklet right there, that has information about those species of trees, both scriptural information, as well as biological information about the trees that are found in that churchyard. And I think this is important because we often think that, oh, well, what's, what's sacred in the church is what's inside. You know, the crucifix is on the wall or the Bible on the, on the shelf or the pictures of the, the stained glass windows. But it seemed to me that the grounds around a church, if they belong to the church, should also be considered sacred ground. And then if you think about that, then the trees that grow in that sacred ground, shouldn't they be sacred also? And so it seemed to be a sort of a, a follow-up or a, a way of extending the sense of the sacred, the sense of what should be protected by a church or a synagogue could be extended to trees. And if we can extend that to trees in a churchyard, what about the trees right next door? What about the trees in the mountains that you can see from that church? Aren't they worthy of being protected as well? And so these are the kinds of questions that we began asking of congregations uh, in order to better understand and better communicate our joint need, our collective need um, to, to, to work with trees and to protect them. And that led then to some joint tree plantings on church grounds, on seminary grounds uh, that, that, were that had participants both from the church as well as from the university. And just last year, all of this work that I've done with faith-based groups led to my being invited to a conversation with the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's the spiritual leader of 85 million Episcopalians and Anglicans around the world. And he was very interested in learning more about ecological justice. And so by having done this work, starting small with one single church at a time, I was able to have some influence perhaps on a very powerful religious leader about ecological justice, which is something that I think is, is very important. So those are some of the things that we've done in terms of knitting together, weaving together the spiritual values of a wide variety of people with the ecological values of trees and forests. So let's move on to aesthetic values and actually, you know, figuring out how to incorporate, incorporate aesthetic values into forests and trees is like super easy because trees and forests have inspired artists and poets and, and visual artists for, for, for millennia really. And so my, uh, approach to this was to carry out what I call canopy confluences. And in these canopy confluences, we find a wild place in, in a forest, and I invite a number of forest ecologists, but also visual artists and opera singers and musicians and poets. And we spend a week together climbing trees up into the forest, up into the canopy, uh, making observations. And then the ecologists make their moss collections and artists make their art. Um, I'll, I'll just show you some examples of some of the results of these canopy confluences. This is a piece of art um, that was created by a sculptor from the Rhode Island School of Design. He came to one of our canopy confluences and when he went back to Rhode Island, he created this beautiful installation of this very fragile globe that gradually began to sort of fall apart and decompose. And when people said, oh my gosh, Bruce, your sculpture is falling apart, he said, Ah, but what I learned in the canopy confluence from the ecologists is that forests are dynamic, that branches fall, that trees fall, that dynamicism is part of the forest ecosystem. We also uh, carried out some gallery shows um, <clears throat> with the art that was produced during these uh, canopy confluences. We had a modern dance choreographer uh, from San Francisco, and she was very interested in creating a dance about the tropical rainforest. So we brought her whole troop down to Costa Rica to my long-term study sites. They interpreted the rainforest as they wished to, and they ended up performing a dance um, to uh, dance audiences in San Francisco and in Seattle. So we were then able to get the message of the beauty 
the fragility, the complexity, the strength of forests through the medium of dance to people who wanted to see dance and who might never have read a National Geographic about tropical forests or come to some academic seminar about tropical rainforests on our canopy. We also had a number of musicians that we put into the canopy, a wooden flute player, an oboist, wooden guitar player, and a, a, and a rap singer. This was one of my students whose name was Duke Brady. Um, he made these fabulous rap songs. And whenever I would play them, you know, like at a middle school or a high school, it was always Duke Brady's rap songs that sort of turned on the students. And so that led to a program we created called Sound Science um, at the Evergreen State College. I hired a professional rap singer named Caution, and he went out with a biologist and with 40 at-risk kids from Tacoma, and they would spend the day out in the morning, they would spend the morning out in the forest or out on our beach in the afternoon, uh, they would come into our sound studios and caution would help them make rap songs about what they had experienced in nature with the trees or the beach. And they ended up cutting a CD that they were able then to bring home to their family and friends that then in a way kind of encapsulated their experiences with a kind of music that they valued that was important to them. Well, the last piece of aesthetics that I'd love to think about um, and that I'm getting more and more into is fashion. Um, because many, many people appreciate fashion and value it and pay money to dress in clothes that are fashionable. Um, it's odd to think of an ecologist that is <laughs> concerned with fashion because normally our field crew looks something like this, I hate to say. But I thought, well, what if I could incorporate epiphytes into fashion? This was my first attempt. This is a moss cape that I sewed on, a cape with, uh, these were mosses from the Olympic Peninsula. I sewed it on with dental floss. It, it worked really well, except it kept growing. It kept getting heavier and heavier. And also it shed very badly. So I, it turned out I was not welcome at a lot of dinner parties. And so I ended up using this as a solution, which was to take a botanically correct image of a canopy dwelling plant, in this case, one called Piper aretum. This is related to the black pepper that you sprinkled on your scrambled eggs this morning, then printed it on the fabric and then had a tailor make a jacket. And you can see that this is the, I think, very attractive little jacket. Um, but what's interesting and what's most important about this is that it comes with a hang tag information about the biology and the conservation of the species that's depicted. So when someone says to me, hey, Nalini, I really, that's a beautiful little jacket, then I can start saying, well, you know, this is a Piper aretum and it's related to the black pepper that you just sprinkled on your scrambled eggs this morning. And if you would like to contribute to its conservation, you could join the World Wildlife Fund. So, you know, let's, let's go from there. So using then fashion, which is very attractive to many people as the vector, just like we did with Barbie, just like we did with these pamphlets, it's a way to communicate, drawing upon the values, not of my values, but the values of other people. So those are, we've, we've covered recreational, um, uh, aesthetic, uh, sorry, spiritual and aesthetic values. And I'd like to move into how we can incorporate the values of conservation, the values of trees and forests, the values of nature, to people who might be living in nature deficit environments. And the, 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 the group of people that live in the most nature deficit environments in our society are those people who are incarcerated in federal prisons and state prisons and tri tribal jails, county jails um, and juvenile detention centers. Um, I started this project in 2004 when I was on the faculty at the Evergreen State College. Uh, we started with some conservation projects. I started a science lecture series uh, for state prisons and county jails where we bring researchers into inside correctional institutions and provide them with research lectures um, that are very, that have been extremely well received, extremely um, welcome by the people who are incarcerated and the administrators as well. In 2011, I moved to the state of Utah and I started a similar program there. We do monthly science lecture series and have conservation projects as well. We've also been carrying out formal evaluations with pre-lecture and post-lecture surveys of what the incarcerated people have learned and their attitudes and their behavior about research and science. And what we have found based on over 2000 responses of these surveys that science knowledge content significantly increases 
attitudes about science and scientists and about the self-identity of the inmates themselves as being becoming science learners um, has, has shifted significantly as well. And their behavior in terms of stating that they wish to share what they've learned with their cellmates or their families has also increased. Well, in addition to the science lectures, we've also been carrying out conservation projects in, in partnership with the people who are incarcerated. Our first project involved the rearing of the Oregon spotted frog, uh, which is a state sensitive species. We um, collaborated with conservation biologists with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they came into these prisons, taught the men how to raise frogs from egg to tadpole to adult frog, and then take the adult frogs and release them in protected wetland areas. We've been working with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the women inmates at the uh, Mission Creek Correctional Center uh, in Washington state now raise the Taylor checker spot butterfly, which is a federally listed butterfly. Again, these are released in protected areas. We've worked with the Nature Conservancy, uh, men in the Stafford Creek Correctional Center in Washington state raise over 300,000 plugs of 17 species of rare and endangered plants for ecological restoration at Fort Lewis. Uh, in, in Utah, we've actually started a project with Hawk Watch, and the men there have built nesting boxes for the American kestrel, which is in decline across all the way across North America. In 2017, we were asked by the Utah State Board of Education to provide similar programming of science and conservation for, for youth in custody, that is youth who are incarcerated in juvenile detention centers. And so we bring science lectures and conservation projects such as raising milkweed for monarch butterfly conservation that the students then understand that they are making a contribution uh, to not only themselves, not only their families, but actually something as big as planet Earth. And that has turned out to be a very powerful uh, message uh, and contribution, I think, um, to these youth. Well, for several years, I was really happy with this, with this prison program because we were bringing science education and conservation and nature to places that were so deficit in these. But I realized pretty early on that we were actually not getting to the people who are incarcerated most deeply sequestered in our system of mass incarceration. And of course, those are the people who are housed in solitary confinement cell blocks or what's called secured housing. Well, we couldn't bring lecturers, we can't bring soil, we can't bring plants, we can't bring frogs to these highly, highly secured places of solitary confinement cell blocks. But what we could do, I realized, was perhaps bring nature imagery. And so what I decided to do was to weave in knowledge that we have about the power of nature imagery in physical and emotional recovery that has occurred, uh, studies that have occurred in hospitals, where we now know that when you look out, if, if a patient looks out at a tree or some aspect of nature versus a cement wall, there's a tendency for them to recover more quickly, to spend fewer hospital days, to be less stressed, less anxious, less aggressive. And it seemed to me, why don't we just translate that to the most nature deficit habitat on earth, which is solitary confinement cell blocks. And we were able to gain access to a supermax prison in Eastern Washington in 2014. They gave us access to a cell block that was divided in half. The, the, all of the inmates had the same risk level, the same mental health capacity and so forth. But on one of the exercise rooms uh, where they, they live, um, uh, we showed nature videos. They had a choice of 38 nature videos that they could see for one hour a day during their time in their exercise room. And on the other side of the cell block, they did not watch any videos at all. Well, we came back after a year of the, of the men who were incarcerated in these solitary confinement cell blocks, and the men self-reported on our surveys and interviews that they felt calmer, they felt more connected to the outside, they had remembered images and activities related to nature from their childhood. Um, but was most significant and most actually of value to the officers and to the administrators of that prison is that those men who watch these nature videos on that side of the cell block committed 26% fewer violent infractions than men on the other side of the cell block that did not watch nature videos. And so that meant that violence was going down, that safety in terms of both the inmates as well as the officers and administrators and staff were experiencing less violence due to the fact that these men had access to nature imagery. 
One of the things that we're now pursuing is trying to understand not only the effects of bringing science education and nature on the inmates, but how does this experience affect those scientists who go into the prisons? And what we have found is that um, the, the scientists who do provide lectures and conservation projects have shifted their idea of the populations of the incarcerated. They've come to understand that these aren't just bad, stupid people, but in fact, they're interested in science. They want to contribute in some way to the earth and that there's interest and appreciation for science and scientists. Now, we also know that these activities, you know, providing a lecture here and there, providing access to nature, contributing to conservation does not solve the deeply ingrained injustices of our system of mass incarceration. But what we do know is that it does bring some light, some hope, some sense of contribution and participation and connection to people who are currently incarcerated. And so these, that's kind of the approach that I've taken in terms of branching out and weaving in. Um, I do wanna emphasize that, you know, what I've been talking about probably sounds like, oh my God, she must spend all her time like doing all this public engagements of what about her science. And I wanna say that, yes, these big projects like that involve state prisons or involve lots of churches, those are big efforts. But I also wanna emphasize that small efforts are also important. And I'll just give you one example of a little effort that I did. I was in Seattle one afternoon and I saw these two young women at a bus stop looking at each other's fingernails and getting really excited about their, each other's fingernails. I am not a fingernail person, but I thought, well, if they're so excited about it, maybe there's something to it. It's like a little girl in Barbie. Like I need to be intellectually humble and, and appreciate that. So I went into a manicurist shop and I asked the, the manicurist to please paint little trees on my fingernails with bright green nail polish. And so for two or three weeks before it all flaked off, I, I could have these great conversations with women who like fingernail polish about trees. And I could talk to them about what's your favorite tree, what's your favorite forest and, and so forth. So even a little act like that can incite conversations, can incite, can incite engagement, can ex incite exchange of people who might be very different from you, but who might share some excitement about, about trees because of the way that you present it to them. And I actually did some math, you know, thinking about the small scale stuff. There are 325 million people in the United States. There are 6.2 scientists and engineers. So if each scientist talks to just 52 people a year, that's one person a week we will have spoken to every single person in the United States. Like, just imagine, you get his latte, talk to your barista about shade-grown coffee. You take an Uber, talk to the driver about gasoline cars versus electric cars. So there you can check off your one person a week, like right there. So I think that to me means that we can all be participants in this weaving this tapestry of care, even if it seems like a very small thing, even a small conversation I think can make a difference. I'd also like to sort of pose the question of who is at the loom? Who is actually weaving together these threads of conservation and of awareness? And um, you know, just in this last 45 minutes, I've described some of the people who are sitting at my loom of conservation, Barbie is one of them. The inmates who, who raise these plants and animals, they're also part of the, the tapestry. People who are in churches. Um, and Caution, a rap singer, seems like an unlikely conservationist. But in this context, all of these entities have contributed to this tapestry of care. I also want to emphasize that, you know, I'm not, my students and I, we're not the only ones doing this. And I want to just emphasize two people in particular as examples of people who have stepped outside of their own discipline and have been incorporating others into it. One of them is Deborah Hamilton, who runs a program in Costa Rica in Monteverde, where I do my field work. Another one is Fred Swanson, who's right here at Oregon State University uh, and runs a reflections program here at um, H.J. Andrews. So the Bellboard Corridor project that Deb Hamilton and runs uh, is basically a reforestation project of the dry Pacific slopes of Costa Rica on the Pacific side that have been almost entirely deforested over sort of 
ever since the Spaniards came. And so that previously was habitat for remarkable birds like the three wattled bellbird and the resplendent quetzal. And so Deb has organized a number of students and ecotourists and campesinos, local people who farm there, to do a lot of tree planting of the particular species that these birds require um, for, their, for their food. In the H.J. Andrews, the Reflections Program brings together ecologists who come to the Andrews with artists, with environmental humanists, with creative writers, and with poets. And they have created a remarkable array of beautiful publications and raise the awareness of the aesthetics of H.J. Andrews in addition to the importance of its ecology. So those are two people who have worked in a fairly small way, but whose influence I feel has been extremely significant in raising awareness, in carrying out conservation, and in keeping us on that knife ridge of hope and despair. So now what I'd like to do is um, think about where you belong in this tapestry of, of care for forests and trees. And I'd like you to think about that special tree, that special forest that I ask you to envision in your mind. And I'd like you to think about and reflect on just for a moment, what are the values that made that tree special to you? Was it something, as you said, I forgot, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Terry. Terry, Terry was telling me about, about her tree. She talked about how the leafing out of her tree tells her something about the passage of time and the movement of seasons, about how it leafs out, how the shade on her deck changes as that tree moves through time on a cyclical basis. So her values might be something that have to do with aesthetics, with a knowledge of time, with an understanding of where she as a human fits in with time and change through the seasons of the year. So if you could, each of you, take a moment to think about, number one, what are the values that you attach to that special tree of yours? And number two, what might be some other societal sectors that, might, that you might link with those values in order to weave in those values into the care of your tree or your patch of forest? If you could take a minute to think about that and then share that with someone at your table, we have a couple minutes to do that. Great, so let's, let's keep moving forward, but if there's, I, I'd be interested after I give my talk to hear about some of these ideas. I'm sure they're very wonderful. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to sort of become, come, come to a close to thank the Starkers and the group here that organized the, this lecture series, because it's helped me reflect on my career as a woman in forest ecology, um, as a person who, really yearns to make as many people as possible in our, in our world um, as aware as possible about the importance of trees and forests. And also just to keep me on this knife ridge so that I don't fall into despair and I don't fall too far onto hope, but that I, I come to the situation that we're in with some kind of a balance. In terms of my own work, in terms of my own career, and in terms of my life, I would say that just as we've heard from women in business that's associated with forests and, and academics and so forth, I would like to say that for me, as I've reflected on my career and my life for this talk, I believe that academia has been a really wonderful loom in which to carry out 
ideas, in which to carry out actions, and in which to make my own efforts to transform my little part of the world. Although academia, at least at the beginning of my career, seemed very strictured, very structured, very restrictive, um, I think that as I've moved forward in it and had the opportunities to branch out, as I said, um, academia has been a really wonderful place for me to continue. I would say that when people ask me like, well, what was your path? I think a lot about paths. I think a lot about careers. I think a lot about especially young women who are endeavoring to start out in a field that appears to be dominated by men. And I, I'd like to share with you some of those ideas about paths that I, I think we often think about, especially students that they think about, well, here I am a student, I'm at point A, and I wanna to get to point B. I wanna be a professor of forest ecology, or I wanna work for Weyerhaeuser, or I wanna do something professional in the, in the field of forestry. And so very often we think of this sort of straight line from A to B, that that's the way you should go. And for some people that really works. Like my brother, he always wanted to be a doctor, he was a pre-med in college. He went to medical school. Now he's a fabulous doctor. He knew exactly what to do, what courses to take and what he needed to do to get from A to B. But for other people, it's not as straightforward. There can be this sort of exploratory thing where you go from one thing to another, but you might end up at B anyway. Then there's the deflected pathway, which is that you might start out at A aiming for B, but you get deflected into C or B or D or E, and you actually never quite end up at B. But here's what I want to contribute, which is some people, and I think this is true of many creative people, it's not about a pathway at all. The way I envision it is that it's a big pot of hot spaghetti sauce inside of which are these meatballs that are moving around. And you start as a student, for example, at meatball A. And you might look at, uh, you know, might say, okay, well, I'm about to graduate. What am I gonna do next? So you wait for meatball B to come along, which might be an internship or a job or a, a different geographical location. And you can sit back and, and make a choice and say, do I jump onto meatball B or do I stay on meatball A until a better meatball comes along? Well, you might wait for a different meatball. Then you ride meatball C for a while until D comes along or E comes along or F comes along. And so it's this combination of chance and choice. And what I think is important about this is that if you're, if you're accepting the meatball theory of life, then you have to pay attention to the matrix because anywhere a new opportunity that you might not expect might be coming up that you can choose whether to jump on or not. And so when someone says to me, and I'm, I'm sort of at meatball W right now, I'm not quite at Z, but I'm definitely not at A, B, or C, and says, gosh, Nalini, you sure have had a great life. You got to be in academia, and you get to work with religious people, and you get to work in prisons, and you get to go to Costa Rica and climb trees. How do I do what you did? And what I have to say is, I can't tell you because since I was a student, all of these meatballs have moved around and there's no reconstruction of what I encountered in my time with what you're encountering in your time. For example, with canopy research, since I was one of the very first people to climb trees, I could climb a tree and just make discoveries all the time because there was hardly anybody else doing canopy research. Well, that's not the case anymore. Now you have to learn about remote sensing and you have to learn a, you know, R and you have to learn about these big data sets because the field of canopy studies has expanded tremendously since when I was a graduate student. So my advice now to young people who come to me and say, how do I, how do I, how do I get to where you are, is that I have to tell them, well, you have to find your own meatballs. So when I look at my favorite tree, and when I think about your favorite tree, I do have faith that we collectively are going to work out how to weave the values of ourselves and our colleagues and our students and our professors and other societal sectors into understanding trees in a holistic way, looking at different ways of knowing, different ways of understanding to create this tapestry of care for what we care about trees and forests, and to make something that is like a real tapestry, something that is complex and connected, something that is strong, something that's useful, and above all, something that is beautiful.
Thank you. We um, definitely appreciate Malini's time. I know I'm inspired by many of the things she has done. I want to say thank you to all of our online viewers. This will conclude our online streaming for